2024. Max Blumenthal joins us now. Max, always a pleasure. Thank you, my dear friend. I have a lot of uh, questions to ask you about Israel, but first a few uh, about Ukraine, uh, which is in dire straits. The commander of, of whose military has been or is about to be uh, fired, which desperately needs manpower, is now going to receive over the next four years some $54 billion uh, from the EU in cash. Isn't this probably going to go down a rat hole like a lot of cash in Ukraine? Or what could they do with it? Well, what is, isn't it earmarked for for weapons and uh, what Victoria Newland, the architect of this entire disaster when she was in the Obama administration, promised will be some some battlefield surprises for Putin. So in that respect, a lot of this money is going straight back to the Beltway bandits, the defense contractors and the people who've been profiting off this war. Um, it's also, you know, aid to prop up Zelensky and to um head off this war of the mandarins that's been brewing in Kiev over the past several months uh, in which we've seen a uh, top deputy to Valery Zeluzhny, the chief of staff, be killed in a package bomb. Uh, who could have orchestrated that? Right. Um, you know, we've seen intelligence chiefs vying for control. We've seen uh, what may have been a kind of Hannibal directive style assassination of Ukrainian captive soldiers, POWs being returned uh, with many of them identified with the Azov battalion, which had for this war erupted been kind of a political enemy of Zelensky. So the aid package is absolutely necessary. It's sort of the, the financial feeding tube for the Zelensky zombie that still controls the a future rump state of Western Ukraine. And it's also necessary that it comes from the EU because all this money is being held up in Congress over the border deal that the Republicans want. So Washington is obviously guiding this. It's no coincidence this took place right as Victoria Nuland left Kiev. So Washington must have been involved uh, in the EU threats to wreck the Hungarian economy and put pressure on uh, President Viktor Orban to go along with this uh, giveaway. Uh, no, no doubt, uh, but uh, Ursula von der Leyen would love to see Orban. Ursula von der Leyen's a completely crazed anti-Russian Cold War, new Cold War ideologue. So I don't know how much nudging she needs from Washington to want to get Hungary out of the picture. I mean, the problem for the EU has always been the need for uh, everyone to vote, for a unanimous vote, and Orban stands there in the way. So this is a destabilization campaign being uh, – continu this is the continuation of a destabilization campaign that's being waged from Brussels, uh, definitely with the Biden administration's support. Uh, Aaron Mate, your colleague, tells us that uh, the uh, Zelensky government or the Zeluzhny military, whatever you want to call it, depending upon whether Zeluzhny keeps his job, is in desperate straits uh, for human beings, uh, that they are snatching people off the street, that their training of them uh, is minimal. This really can't go on much longer. Uh, $50 billion. Uh, over four years is not going to produce the human beings that they require. I'm not going to hire mercenaries with it. Well, I mean, what, it looks like this this Russian flight that was downed by an anti-aircraft battery, can, which was filled with Ukrainian prisoners of war, uh, was downed with a NATO anti-aircraft battery, either a Patriot or uh, German Iris, uh, German anti-aircraft battery. And it takes a lot of training to operate those. The training takes months and it requires... A lot of personnel to operate a Patriot battery. So it's possible that just human error, a human error took place in which some fresh bodies were just shoveled into the field to operate sophisticated weaponry and they wound up killing over 70 Ukrainian soldiers. But then we're seeing all of these reports in mainstream media about the women of the Ukrainian military. And every single one of these reports features a photograph of two 
photogenic, attractive women carrying weapons, and we're supposed to admire them and maybe fetishize them. You know, it's Slay Queen. It's literally Slay Queen. Uh, they're feminist heroes. And what, what it really signals is something similar to the, uh, what were they, the Yugen Corps, the, where the, the, at the end of the failed Nazi German military campaign against Russia and the allies, against the Soviet Union and the allies, they were forced to recruit teenagers, adolescent boys, and old men actually to conscript them. That's what we're seeing in Ukraine. There just aren't any men left. An entire generation has been thrown into the slaughterhouse in order to annoy and attack Russia. And it doesn't seem to have made much of a material difference uh, to Russia's economy, to Russia's standing in the world. If anything, it's blown back on the West, on Western economies. So this has been a disaster. Yeah, Ukraine. And there's, it's a matter of time before Ukrainians, even in Western Ukraine, start to accept it as such and turn on their leadership. Yeah. Uh, the, the president, Zelensky, is even having trouble firing Zeluzhny because of his extraordinary popularity among the troops. So I, I think we can conclude before we move on to um, Israel that Ukraine is almost literally on its last legs and this uh, EU or orchestrated pot of cash is not enough to save it. Yeah, well, I'd just say in closing we can kind of look at Taiwan as a model for what Ukraine could be, or uh, even Israel, the West, the collective West will continue to, fun to funnel weapons and fork billions in of dollars of aid over to Western Ukraine just to continue perpetually antagonizing Russia. I don't think that program will end, and partly because it's been so profitable for the arms industry in the U.S., which is one of our few productive industries. Uh, before we uh, went on air, you um, uh, expressed a view that there might be a, a ceasefire in Gaza uh, this weekend. Can you tell us what you know? Yeah, there was actually celebratory gunfire in parts of Gaza yesterday, or like 12, maybe 12 to 24 hours ago, when the Qatari foreign minister during a talk at Johns Hopkins University announced that Hamas had accepted uh, terms of, of ceasefire. Now, Hamas has come out and sort of not poured cold water on it, but said that that was premature and that they have not yet accepted the terms of a ceasefire. Uh, but what we're seeing now is serious. And Israel, by providing its terms to the Qatari mediators to pass over to Hamas signals its seriousness. The seriousness is being driven by uh, figures in Israel's war cabinet who are opponents of Netanyahu, former Israeli army chief of staff, Gadi Eisenkot, and, and Benny Gantz, also former chief of staff. Uh, people who are known in Gaza as butchers, uh, but they, you know, uh, Eisenkot has lost a son and a nephew in this war. And they have decided that uh, it's time to make a deal. On you, the other hand, about a, a yeah. permanent deal or or a ceasefire just long enough to exchange hostages. No, this would be longer than long enough to exchange hostages. Uh, both sides would take, uh, let's say, they they could exchange. We saw them exchange as many as one hundred uh, hostages and prisoners uh, hostages in Gaza in about four days. This is going to be at least, I would expect this to be at least 35 days. And when it's that long, it stops the Israeli military's momentum, such as it is, to the extent they have any in its tracks. And that may be part of the American calculus, according to the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the Biden administration can't really impose a ceasefire by actually withholding arms, which would have guaranteed one today. So... What they can do is a humanitarian pause and make it as long as possible. And within 35 days, it could be extended more. And the idea is 35 hostages will come out of Gaza who are women, people who are sick or wounded, and the elderly. Um, what Hamas appears to be demanding, though, is something that could be potentially earth shattering uh, for the political future of Palestine. Well, should we count on Israel stopping uh, murdering people during the during the thirty or thirty five days? Uh, that's a good question. 
here, here are the issues. And we've talked about this before. One of the red lines for the Israeli security apparatus, the sort of securitocrats who control everything, is uh, the release of major Palestinian security prisoners. And that's what Hamas is demanding. They're demanding Marwan Barghouti, Ahmad Sadat, and the former um, mil commander of the um, whatever military units Hamas may have been able to assemble in the West Bank. Um, these are guys serving long, long prison terms. They command enormous authority. Marwan Barghouti is not Hamas. He is someone who could actually bring Hamas and Fatah together and lead a unity government. He's enormously popular across Palestine. Ahmed Sadat, not Hamas. He comes from PFLP, which is actually a secular uh, left-wing group that has a storied history but is much weaker than it used to be, but he's a very popular figure as well. So it's clear what Hamas is trying to do is establish a national unity government where they kind of exist behind the scenes, but they're not actually leading. And other actually popular figures, unlike Mahmoud Abbas, are in control. And that's a major threat to Israel uh, What it and what it seeks to achieve with the Palestinians. So it's unclear if they will accept those terms. And then you have, with Netanyahu, his political cabinet, his governing coalition, which is razor thin, and it hinges on total fanatics like Itamar Ben Gvir uh, and Bezalel Smotrich, who come from the Jewish power, Otsma Yehudit party. They don't have that many seats. They represent the most extreme, violent settler, uh, you know, ultra-nationalists in the occupied West Bank and they will have none of the prisoner swap. Um, so if Netanyahu goes ahead with this deal, it's likely that his coalition will collapse. And if his coalition collapses, he faces four possible corruption cases and going back to trial, and he's no longer immune because he's not in government every, anymore, so he could go to jail. So it doesn't seem like it's in Netanyahu's interests. And we've seen Netanyahu use extreme language against Hamas and... Uh, the Israeli Mossad actually attempt to antagonize Qatar, for example, to release compromising photos of the emir and so forth uh, in an effort to sabotage this deal. So I, I, it's unclear to me, but I think all of the rejectionism is coming from the Israel. Most of the rejectionism is coming from the Israeli side. It is, is the Israeli acceptance or rejection of this, Max, solely up to Netanyahu? Uh, I, I would... I. I wouldn't say so. I mean, there are other factors that can bring Netanyahu down. Um, and he needs his war cabinet. He needs the protection of this war cab of these figures in the war cabinet, like Eisenkot and especially Benny Gantz, because these were sort of the leaders of the protest movement that was right. threatening Netanyahu almost in an existence. Well, I wouldn't say existentially, but threatening him heavily prior to October 7th. And right now, he's managed to keep that protest movement, which is completely about him, out of the streets. However, a new protest movement has developed around releasing the hostages. They're escalating. They're stopping traffic. They're occupying space outside the prime minister's residence again. So there's pressure from, from other points besides just the far right flank of his, co of his governing coalition. Do you know anything of this recent uh, Jerusalem Post report that Israel has killed 10,000 Hamas fighters and Hamas is asking uh, for some sort of uh, peace deal? I mean, is this is this Mossad nonsense or is this is this based in fact? I mean, even if it were true, it, I don't think it would make a difference on the ground. Israel lost has lost three officers in the last 48 hours. They're continuing to take bodies in the Gaza Strip, um, taking many injuries, especially uh, east of Khan Yunus. The fighting remains intense there. Uh, so that would be what, one third of what they what is said to be the fighting force of Al-Qassam, which is the military wing of Hamas. There are other factions in the field, by the way. I mean, the just I can think of a, a tiny faction like the DFLP, the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine. They have like 800 people in the field fighting. 
They're doing mortar launches. They have RPGs. And how hard is it to get a 15 year old who lost his entire family to pick up an RPG and fire it at a tank after a light amount of training? So uh, these people can be replaced. The weapons are locally made. I don't think it makes much of a difference. And I obviously, I think that's exaggerated. If you look at the, the casualty counts from the Palestinian Ministry of Health, 40% uh, of those killed out of just about 26,000 or 27,000, 40% are children, children, mostly small children. And then, mm. a, a not, and then another close to 30% are women. So it just doesn't really add up. It doesn't make a difference. And if Israel's submitting its terms of a cessation of hostility directly to Hamas, uh, they're pretty serious about ending this too. Is the Jerusalem Post uh, trustworthy when it comes to these things, or is it a mouthpiece for Netanyahu and company? Jerusalem Post represents this sort of uh, Anglo settler community around Jerusalem uh, and therefore has kind of a right wing pro settler anti Palestinian bent. Its editor, who was recently fired, Avi Mayer. Uh, he was a longtime Israeli propagandist who moved to Israel from New Jersey, and he was fired for running an article which insisted that a Palestinian baby who had been killed in an Israeli airstrike was actually a plastic doll. So I think that speaks to the credibility of that paper. But sometimes they turn up some valuable uh, insights into the thinking of the Israeli political and security elite. This... Um... Uh, instance in which uh, Israeli uh, intelligence figures, or maybe they were soldiers, uh, dressed as healthcare uh, providers and invaded a hospital uh, in the West Bank and uh, murdered uh, three Palestinian men in their hospital beds while they were being uh, treated. Did that have any effect, or is there any appreciable or measurable effect on the Israeli public? Or did <laughs> I mean, they say, you know, it's, it's, it's become kind of a common saying now that every Israeli accusation is a confession. And we heard Israel accuse the staff of, of Al-Shifa Hospital, the largest hospital in the Gaza Strip, sort of the linchpin of the healthcare system in the major population center of Gaza City of being covert Hamas agents running a Hamas base beneath the hospital. The central command center for Hamas was beneath that hospital. And obviously what Israel just needed to do was to disable that hospital so that it could start to depopulate Northern Gaza and create a humanitarian crisis. And they did so with the total consent of the US government, the Biden administration, the US media. They never found the command and control center. They found a little tunnel that led to nowhere, then they blew it up before anyone could actually get down there and look at it on an independent basis. And now they're running up in a hospital in Janine, dressed as doctors, an actual death squad known as the Mistaravim. These are Jewish Israelis of Arab origin who come from Arab countries who can look like Palestinians. And they often will dress up as protesters at Palestinian protests uh, and try to make the protest either more violent or they'll just whip out guns in the middle of it and start arresting people. They assassinate people on streets undercover. And here they are in a hospital. They assassinate three young men who are said to be uh, fighters. One of them was in a coma and they shot him in the head. And this is being praised at the highest level in Israel and in Israeli media, like it's some badass scene out of Fauda. Matthew Miller, the sp spokesman, or should I say the, the kind of inadvert inadvertent, unintentional comedian at the best comedy club in town, which is at Foggy Bottom in the State Department. It's some real dark comedy, some real gallows humor. Matthew Miller defended this, they, they have this talking point now at the State Department and the White House, and you'll hear this from John Kirby as well at the White House, that, that uh, Israel has the right to defend itself in accordance with international law. So they're asked about this heinous scene where they send a death squad dressed as doctors and nurses into a hospital to execu execute a comatose teenager, shooting him in the face, taking all the doctors hostage temporarily. And he says that. He says that. So there's no breaks on what Israel can do at this point. There's no uh, abatement to the slaughter in light of the uh, determination by the International Court of Justice that there's plausible evidence to believe that there was genocidal intent 
and plausible evidence to believe that there's genocidal behavior. That did not temper, correct me if I'm wrong, Max, the prime minister, Smotrich, Ben Gavir, or the IDF. Yeah, I mean, especially the, the IDF, if you can call them a defense force. Um, one of the key foundations of the South African case against Israel was incitement to genocide or in the intent to commit genocide expressed at the highest levels of Israeli leadership and among the rank and file of the uh, reservists in the so-called IDF who have invaded Gaza. And since the ICJ decision, we haven't seen any commanders in the Israeli military impose a no social media uh, rule where soldiers can't boast of burning homes or blowing up schools. We recently saw, and when I say recently, I think this video came out 72 hours ago. It's all over social media. Is A group of Israeli reservists went up into Islamic University to the, I think, the wing of a, the medical school, whipped out Torahs, Torah scrolls, like the one I read from at my bar mitzvah, and began dancing with them and parading around with them in Israeli flag, with Israeli flags. They proudly posted that on social media and then they blew up the whole building mm. so this this is how they're they're this is how afraid they are of anyone actually enforcing the icj decision and they have no fear because of washington because of tony blinken by the way right now outside tony blinken's house there is an encampment that's growing of protesters outside his mansion uh in the arlington mclean area one of the wealthiest areas in the in the DC area. People are lining the streets and they're sleeping there in tents and they're protesting him. Um, and so the pressure is growing for a ceasefire. Um, but at the same time, there isn't enough pressure to enforce the ICJ decision. Um, President Biden today uh, uh, on his way to Michigan campaigning uh, announced a um, some sort of uh, sanctions against Israeli settlers in the West Bank. Yeah. So before we get to Netanyahu's uh, response, how, how could he possibly uh, enforce such sanctions? This is, this, this isn't, isn't even window dressing. It's less than window dressing. Well, yeah, it is window dressing. It's sort of an empty gesture in support. It's an empty gesture and it's directed at Ben Gvir and Smotrich and Netanyahu's coalition partners. Um, and they're furious about it. They're easily agitated and triggered, but uh, it's it might not matter to violent settlers because they may not want to travel to the United States or have US bank accounts or really care about much beyond their own messianic duty to terrorize Palestinians and replace the Al-Aqsa Mosque with the third temple. Mm -hmm. uh, what would really matter, what would actually carry concrete consequences for this movement, this messianic terrorist settler movement would be if the Treasury Department would revoke the tax exempt status of nonprofits, which are right now involved in raising money for settlements in the Gaza Strip, and which also raise money for these very violent settler terrorists that they're sanctioning. They sanctioned four people so far. Revoke the 501c3 status of the Hebron Fund, for example, and all of these other settler nonprofits. And then you might start seeing some results, but they won't do it. Oh, and by the way, you could just stop sending Israel spare parts for its F-16s and yeah, the war well, that, will end tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, that that uh, is, is unlikely to happen. Here's what Prime Minister Netanyahu said in response to these uh, sanctions. Israel's acts against all those who break the law everywhere. And uh, can you uh, go, scroll up, please, uh, Chris? Okay, I thought I wasn't reading from the top. You're, you're, you're correct. Israel acts against all those who break the law everywhere, and therefore there is no room for exceptional measures in this regard. The absolute majority of the settlers in Judea and Samaria are law-abiding citizens, many of whom are currently fighting in the regular and reserve army for the defense of Israel. Well, the whole settlement is illegal. I mean, no one's going to believe a statement like that from him. Right, right. Well, I mean, the 
you know, there are people in Hebron right now yeah. who have killed Americans and who are American citizens and the FBI has not demanded their extradition who killed Alex Ode, who was the uh, West Coast regional director for the Anti-Discrimination Committee, the Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee. Mm. I believe it was in 1984, they bombed his office. They fled to Hebron and they're still there. Um, my colleague and friend, David Sheen, who's an Israeli journalist, has investigated and identified them. Um, and there are so many other figures who've been responsible for documented acts of terrorism against Palestinians, killing and stabbing them, bombing uh, mayors. They're out. They're freely operating within Israeli politics, within the rabbinate, and within even Israeli media. Um, and you have a campaign right now to free the killer of the Dawabshe family, uh, which was uh, in the from the town of Duma in northern in the northern West Bank. Their home was firebombed by settlers. And uh, much of the family died in agony as they were burned alive, including small children. Uh, mm -hmm. Itamar ben Gvir, the security minister in Netanyahu's cabinet, had a, has a picture of Brooke Goldstein on his wall, the settler killer of 29 Palestinians worshiping at the Ibrahimi Mosque in mm. Hebron. And I mean, that's who these people are. They're in the government. So the idea that Netanyahu can be trusted to enforce the law is so laughable that it shouldn't even be taken into consideration. I don't want to uh, subject you to something you've already seen. Did we show you last week Ben Gavir and Smotrich uh, at a rally uh, shouting and at and demanding uh, behavior from uh, Netanyahu who was who wasn't there? Yeah. Okay. And then we don't. We don't. This was well. No, we didn't actually. So oh, if you want to right. address so, that, okay, yeah, this that. is in Hebrew, but there are translations. So. Uh, here we go. Cut number two. Mr. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, I'm addressing you from this stage. It's a shame to wait another 19 years to understand that Gush Katith and northern Samaria must be returned. The responsibility of brave leadership is to make courageous decisions. We are settling our land from width to length, controlling it and fighting terror always and bringing with God's help security to all of Israel. You know what the answer is. Without settlement, there is no security. These are the two guys that may bring down his government if he uh, has a prolonged uh, ceasefire. Yeah, and uh, at least four out of ten Israelis polled last week support them. Wow. in resettling the Gaza Strip. Uh, one of the uh, Israeli government ministers, checking his name, uh, yeah, no, it was a, there was an Israeli member of Knesset who appeared at that conference named Amihai Chikli, and he explicitly called for resettling Gaza and expelling its population, ethnic cleansing. And he was invited to the, you mentioned uh, the Jerusalem Post earlier, he was invited to a Jerusalem Post conference being held in Berlin, Germany, uh, to be held with Die Welt, which is the major tabloid of the actual Springer media empire, uh, at a joint perspective German-Israeli summit. So this genocidal psychopath was going to be taken seriously in Germany, and he was going to be at the conference with Stephen Erlanger, who is a top New York Times correspondent, along with the German foreign minister. That's how the West is treating mm. these fanatics. It's treating them not, it's not just treating them with kid gloves. You know, you hit something with kid gloves, you're still hitting them. It's being welcomed with, on a red carpet in Germany. Uh, this is insane. It is insane. <sighs> All right, Max, we've had enough. <laughs> Every week we do this. You are so knowledgeable, so filled uh, with facts, so insightful uh, in your analysis, so courageous in your uh, choice of words, so articulate. And every week it seems to be getting worse. Thank you. Well, you know, we may have a ceasefire and we'll see people, we'll hopefully see Palestinians and Israelis 
freed and maybe there'll be something to celebrate all, after all this. Yeah. And then we can uh, move on to some uh, new election year PSYOP or something like that. Right. right. <laughs> I have a feeling this is going to go on for a while because BB knows what's uh, coming when it ends. Thank you, Max.